Oh, thanks you. Um, just let me get my stuff going here. Yeah, so as already mentioned, my name is Christian Stoner. I work from the Oslo office for the kit company where I've been for the last 12 years. Um, last four years I've been uh, working on the 3D offerings of Qt. Uh, but yeah, that's enough about me. Uh, let's just dive in. So these are the topics I want to go through today. Uh, I'll start by looking at the 3D offerings in Qt and try to answer some questions around that. Um, before I take a look at what Qt Quick 3D is and what it provides, um, this is not going to be a deep dive into 3D. Uh, I'll try to keep it very simple uh, using a very simple example and building on that, just showing off how to get easily started with Qt Quick 3D and uh, basically showing how easy it is to use. Um, yeah, I'll also take a look at mixing 2D and 3D content with QtQuick 3D and QtQuick. Uh, that's one of QtQuick 3D's strong points. So I'll take a look at two ways of doing that. I think that will be, be interesting. Um, after that, I'll take a look at the new features coming up in QtQuick uh, 3D 4.6.2 and say something about what we think will come post 6.2. Yeah, so these are the offerings of 3D offerings in Qt today. Uh, we have Qt 3D, we have 3D Studio, and we have Qt Quick 3. Uh, of course, all of these provide 3D support in, in some way, but in a different way. Uh, uh, first off, uh, we have Qt Quick 3, no, sorry, Qt 3D, uh, which is a high level abstraction with low level APIs. Uh, what I mean by that is it has a considerable barrier to entry. Uh, it has new concepts like the entity component system and a fully configurable frame graph. Uh, it's extremely flexible uh, with what it can do, but I also think it's something that targets more advanced users that has um, requirements that are outside the two other offerings we have, uh, 3D Studio and, and Qtquick 3D. Uh, there's also a fair amount of abstraction on top of Qtquick on Qt 3D, which I've also mentioned here, that's morally, mostly for the uh, a bit historical for how we ended up with Qt Quick 3D. We actually tried to put Qt 3D under 3D Studio, but at the time we had uh, run into severe problems scaling down to the the entry level embedded hardware uh, we saw our users having using so that got us into a bit of a problems and we had to backtrack a little bit and we then came up with Qt quick 3d uh, as a replacement for together with the 3d studio as a replacement no sorry see there's many 3d solutions here uh, 3d studio uh, Qt Quick 3D will, together with Design Studio, will be a replacement for 3D Studio in the in the future. Uh, 3D Studio is a very uh, designer-centric solution. Uh, it has a very tied engine to OpenGL. Uh, it also has uh, concepts that feel fairly foreign to uh, Qt or that Qt already had better solutions for like states and components. Um, it also had declarative languages to describe its own scene format, materials, uh, effects. And we felt that didn't really 
fit with the unification story we tried to do for 2D and 3D. And in the same way Qt3D works, it's very uh, self-driven. So we had extra steps needed to um, integrate and sync it with Qt-Quick. I know there's been improvements to Qt3D uh, lately to improve on this. So, but this is more a historical uh, context. Um, yeah. And we also wanted something even more high level and easy to use and something that just fitted into the cute quick uh, story already and integrated well there. Um, so the result of all that is, is cute quick 3D. Um, it has very high level concepts like camera, light model, and, and those can easily be inserted in, in existing QtQuick applications to add support for 3D. Uh, QtQuick 3D is a very passive module in the sense that it only does what it's instructed to do, uh, which is normally um, it gets its uh, drive from QtQuick. Uh, so it's more of an extension of QtQuick than, than a separate thing. Yeah, I'll then go into which one I should choose. Um, well, as I already said, uh, Quick 3D together with Design Studio will replace the 3D Studio from old uh, eventually. So that leaves only uh, Qt Quick 3D and Qt 3D, and I think in most most cases the right choice would be to pick Qt Quick 3D. It covers most most 3D cases, and and it integrates really well with Qt Quick. Uh, and I think the the 3D needs of more advanced users. Uh, will be identified by those those that actually have that requirement and they'll see if Qt3D is the right choice for them uh, compared to Quick 3 d So... Uh, Christian, short yeah. comment, we still see the start slide, so you need to start advance the slides. And I don't know, you oh. need to um, press the arrows. Oh. Okay, so then I'm... Feel it. Oh, it's not okay. There, it's changing. Okay, it wasn't changing. Sorry about that. I didn't actually notice that. Um. Yeah. So, I think this is where I'm at. Yeah. So the primary goals for us when we um, wanted to create quick 3D was that it should be simple and easy to use. Um, it should have high level concepts like camera light model and you should just be able to put that into your quick, quick scene and, and get 3D content. Uh, we also wanted that there was no uh, prior knowledge needed from the user about 3D. Um, of course we had to back that with the excellent documentation, which I think we have been very good at adding. Uh, we also wanted it to be lightweight, uh, similar to uh, how Qtquick initially was made. It's it's very embedded uh, centric. Um, so we always keep an eye on that, that we, we have really good performance on embedded. And I think that's something that benefits uh, the desktop in the end as well. Um, another thing that was very, at least I feel very strongly about is that we needed a code and a render that was easy to understand and reason about and be able to easily see the flow, the, the flow data and code and And yes, and that's also something I think we've been, been able to maintain uh, even while we've been adding new stuff. 
another key thing was that we needed it to integrate with Crete quick. Like mixing 2D and 3D content should be easy and inexpensive. So we needed, we didn't want to always go through uh, off-screen rendering. Uh, we didn't want the renderer to be completely detached. So we needed the renderer to be able to talk to each other as well. That That's what I mean by the, the unified rendering. Uh, one benefit of, of doing that and getting that is also that we can get really good looking text, but not just text, like any good quick item that's rendered directly into the scene with 3D transforms will look fairly good. Uh, the last important point for us were, was the, the tooling. We needed excellent tooling. Uh, we needed to have at least something as good as the, the 3D Studio for designers. Um, it needed to be good for both designers and, and developers, not just one of them. Uh, so that, that's been in the back of our mind and that's something that, that's important for us. Uh, and it's something that's much more important when you're doing 3D. There's uh, much more involved with lighting and positioning and stuff like that. So uh, artists are usually used to working in very visual tools. So if you look at the architectural overview of Qtquick 3D, you can see it sits on top of the RHI together with Qtquick. And it has its own uh, scene graph with special items. And we have a tight coupling between the two renderers. The, we don't do uh, 2D rendering in the 3D engine or 3D uh, rendering in the Good quick engine. We didn't want to to dis destroy that by adding more complexity to either of them, but instead we made uh, that it's so that they have really good communication and can do inline rendering, jump from one to an, to the other. Uh, another point I think is worth taking up is asset and asset conditioning. This is also something. Uh, again, that's more important or more visible when you're doing 3D. Uh, often the content you create comes from uh, content tools like Blender, Maya, uh, Substance Painter, uh, those kinds of tools. And they will export uh, into some uh, format like uh, GLTF or FBX or their own formats. and and we need to condition those um, assets into something that's efficient for our real-time renderer. So, because when th those are exported, they are exported with fidelity in mind and not necessarily uh, efficiency. So that's where the conditioning comes in. Uh, we have this tool called Balsam, uh, interestingly enough, which is our main conditioning tool that converts uh, formats to QML components, and it also then generates uh, the textures and materials and everything that's needed to, to then put that into your application. It also has other things like you can do uh, texture compression and yeah, that's what I can think of at the moment. Uh, in addition, we have uh, the shader gen tool. That's an experimental tool. Again, it hasn't changed. Sorry about that. It removes. So we have the shader gen tool, which is, a, as I said, an experimental tool. Uh, it generates materials at build time by inspecting the, the scene and then trying to figure out what materials that will be needed in the application so that we don't need to do that at runtime and then therefore saving a lot of time. Uh, that's a fairly complex operation. Uh, so 
that's why it's still experimental. We haven't seen that much use for it yet, but uh, that's something we're going to invest more. I also want to mention that it doesn't actually generate driver-specific shader binaries, but it generates spare V byte code that can be consumed by the Qt RHI later. So it generates uh, materials in essence. Uh, the next item here is the runtime loader, which is a new item for Qt 6.2. That is what it says. It can load the same assets at runtime. Um, it at the moment supports GLTF2. And what it does is a bit opposite of the balsam tool. Uh, the scene is not uh, generated at build time, but it does it at runtime. So it creates all the objects at runtime, and you can uh, reload uh, with different type uh, formats, uh, now different models, and you can use the runtime loader, which is a special node to to move and interact with the the model, or or even scenes. Um, it's fairly. Uh, new so the api is not that extensive yet so let's look at a minimal scene and how that looks in Qt quick 3d this should be fairly familiar uh, at least the beginning here we have a window and we have a view which view 3d which is a view into our 3d scene uh, we have a camera and a light and a model and and that's it uh, i've set the source here to be uh, a cube that's a built-in primitive and of course i've given it a, a material with the color green and yeah that's how easy it is to get started it doesn't take much to get get something on the screen uh, and it doesn't take that much to get something more impressive uh, like this uh, I've stole this uh, model from the GL2, GLTF2 sample library. Uh, I'm not I'm not that worst in the, the 3D tools that I can create something like that myself yet. But again, it's it. This is the same example. I've only changed the the model to be the runtime loader here on line 30, and I, I've given it source, which is the GLTF2 binary format file. And for some extra effect, I've uh, added uh, a light probe, uh, which is the which is a HDR texture, which it will use to to um, light the model, give a more realistic lighting condition here. And just to show that same texture, you can see the ref maybe see the reflection of the, the texture uh, in the helmet in the shiny parts. Uh, I also also said that. The background mode to use uh, the, the skybox mode which means it's going to use that light probe to to build the, the skybox as well yeah so the message here is that, that you can get something something fairly nice like this fairly easily yeah so let's move over to mixing 2d and 3d um, that means we do uh, we have two modes for this. There's a textured path and a direct path or inline path uh, for both 2D and 3D. Uh, scenes can still be rendered into textures. Uh, that's still a flex flexible way to do it if you need to apply, uh, say, that scene on a, on, a, on a model that's not flat, uh, say, a cylinder or something like that. But both 2D and 3D items are defined in the same, same scene. So if we look at the example here, we have um, a button on line 27, which is just defined in line in our 3D scene. And that's pretty much all it is to it. Did the, the, this item, which is a, a quick pick control item, a button, will then be rendered in line by the 2D engine. 
so good quick so what will happen is that uh, when we get to this uh, item it will branch off to the cute quick uh, 3d engine no good quick engine with the 3d transform and that will uh, position and draw the, the item as expected the nice thing of this is of course that there's uh, no need to go through uh, uh, offline rendering and so we don't pay any extra cost for that which we have discovered costs a lot of on on some some devices. Uh, the drawback of this is, of course, it's flat. Uh, as I said, the textured mode you can apply to a model. Uh, you cannot do that here unless it's flat. You can push position it so it it, it is on a flat surface, but it's still going to be a, a flat item. Uh, I also highlighted on line 31 that the coordinate systems in, in the 2D world and the 3D world are slightly different with the Y position uh, uh, flipped. Uh, the consequence of that is that uh, if you want to position the an item, a quick item in the 3D scene, you should be aware that you either need to do this or, or maybe better uh, wrap the item in a node and then you can position it uh, more logically in the 3C. Uh, another thing to, to be aware of is anchoring. Anchoring actually works, but it when anchoring to a 3D item, it will use the, the, the center of that object as its reference point. So you might need to put some uh, an offset to to get what you want. Yeah, and then we have the texture path, which is a bit more involved. I, as you know, need to to set a material on some model that you want to render that uh, source scene two so you can see here on line 33 we have a texture uh, it has a source item property which you can give your uh, cute quick item um, and that will then be rendered into a texture and become the texture and you then can apply that to a model uh, this is very flexible but again there's some caveats here especially when it comes to um, zooming and, and getting close to uh, items that are going through a texture, they will not appear that crisp, they will get blurry, uh, same way as you would if you scale an image. Uh, you, you'll get some of that if, if the size of the, the item is not uh, correct. And that's usually not that easy when you're constantly moving the camera or, or scaling items. So here I put both of the, the modes side by side. Uh, of course, I exaggerated the, the left side, which is the texture path a little bit, uh, but it shows the kind of effect you will get when you go through a texture. Uh, this texture, as you saw in the in the example, is is on a rectangle here, and of course, when we get closer, the texture will get stretched to to fit as as the the rectangle gets bigger. Uh, the opposite happens, or not the opposite, but as you can see for the the inline uh, rendered or direct rendered. Uh, item it stays really crisp the same with the texture but also the the lines around the button uh, it looks really nice and, and crisp and it will do that at whatever distance you are to it it will it will render with with from critical 3d with the correct information in 3d transform so new features in 6.2 Our instancing, 
um, which I've shown here. That's uh, tech was tech pre preview in six one. Uh, we lifted the tech preview for six two, uh, so it should be be fully usable. And I don't think we did any big changes to it. Um, yeah, I came up with this horrific example. Again, this is the, the exact same example I started with. I've, the only difference is I put the push button as a texture on the, the cube and uh, put instancing using uh, random instancing, having random position and colors for it. I think there's about a, a thousand um, uh, cubes here. Um, yeah, so instancing is, of course, about drawing the same object multiple times and then doing it in one draw call, which makes it uh, very efficient. Uh, the bad thing, of course, is that there's only one of these cubes that are, is the real one and that you can push. Next is particles. Uh, we added 3D particles, that is. Uh, that's the 3D version of the the particles uh, you might be familiar from Qtquake. Uh, this also was tech preview in 6.1, but that also has been lifted now for 6.2. Uh, it uses instancing for the model mode, which you see here. There's two modes uh, for uh, for doing particles. There's the the model uh, version, and there's uh, a sprite version. Uh, both instancing and particles have uh, excellent blog posts. I recommend looking at those. Uh, I'm not going to dig deeper into this today. So, uh, yeah, please have a look at those. Runt runtime asset loading, I already uh, mentioned. Uh, so in the picture here, I've also enabled instancing for that. That's also supported. So. Uh, I don't remember how many module models were used here, but same thing. Uh, we're doing instancing with that whole model uh, with random position and color. Um, the API, as I also touched on this, the API for this is is not that extensive yet. Uh, it's completely new now for six two, and so. We're investigating ways to give better access to uh, the sub components or at runtime, um, but that's something that will come in later versions. Last uh, feature added for 6.2 is uh, parallax occlusion mapping. That's a more advanced technique for doing bump mapping or normal mapping, for those that's familiar with that. Basically, that's trying to uh, fake depth, uh, the, the appearance of depth in, the, in a model using textures and without adding, adding extra vertices to the model. And yeah, that's, it's pretty nice. It, it gives a really nice realistic look. Uh, yeah. So what's next? Uh, tooling, that's going to be a big point for us. We're going to spend some time getting uh, Design Studio up to speed with the, the, the new stuff in Qtquake for 6.2 and hopefully close the gap with 3D Studio soon. So, so those using 3D Studio will get a nice transition over, over to Qtquake 3D and Design Studio. We're also going to look at the asset pipeline and add better and more support for formats there. Uh, I'm not completely sure what we plan there, except that that's the that's topic we're going to do in parallel with the uh, improving uh, design studio. And of course, getting feedback. Uh, we want more feedback about what, what's working well and, and what, what's missing and what, what people would see. Yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for listening in. And
maybe if there's some questions, we can take them now. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Yeah, and, and um, sorry, sorry about the slides. That I don't know what. Yeah, no problem. Um, so um, there's one question from Hannah. She's asking, are there any plans for Qt Quick 3D and AR VR applications or Team VR or Open XR or? Uh, yes to all, <laughs> I would say. Uh, we're experimenting with this. Uh, there's, I don't think we have like a, a version set for that yet, but uh, there's uh, versions. Uh, and prototypes uh, floating around testing this. So definitely something that will be coming. OK. Um, and Nuno asks, um, can you show it? I don't know if it's already uh, done. So maybe uh, he asks, can you show uh, exa an example of loading um, the GLTF at runtime and interacting with it? Um, and do you import the camera lights? And animations uh, at runtime, and how do you expose them in uh, QML? Yeah, so uh, I cannot show that here. We the the code is uh, available already, and there's an example showing showing it off. That's the one I, I showed. Um, yeah, so it does load the whole scene. So it does load cameras, animations, and, and the whole the whole lot from the scene. The problem is that. As I said, the API is fairly limited yet. I'm investigating ways to expose those things. Of course, you can have multiple cameras and animation tracks, and we need some way to, to expose that. But at the moment, we don't have that, and I would require using private APIs. But fully po possible if you're willing to, to, to dive into those private APIs. OK. Yeah, that's it for questions. Um, so thanks again, Christian. Yeah, thanks.